I want to begin by thanking the organizers of the colloquium and on art and decoloniality, and especially to Nicholas um, for inviting me to be presenting um, my paper. I'm delighted to be part of the proceedings. I'm sorry to be switching to English. Um, I wish I was a better student. I'd been a better student of French when I was younger, but I was a bit of a delinquent. So I have another disclaimer in that I don't really work on art and aesthetics, but I do work on political imaginaries, dreams and festivals as modes of subaltern political practice. My sort of work focuses on hopes, values and the political mobilization of poor and landless peasants and working classes before and after the partition and independence of the subcontinent from British colonial rule. And then their struggles and, in, and resistance against the world that came to be. And I do this from the context of Pakistan. In 2011, people reclaimed the streets, parks and public spaces in major financial districts across the world as part of the Occupy movement. This movement amplified marginalized spaces, occupied spaces and reimagined a new world that was necessary after the 2007 and eight global financial crisis, which had exposed the gross inequalities between those who had and those who didn't. This was of course not the first time that people had demanded for the world to be reimagined for the 99% or in my case, the 95%. My paper re revisits a similar moment in history, the 1957 Gagmari festival in East Pakistan. And I will use the festival to speak about the aesthetics and politics of subaltern occupation, internationalism, and joy. The presentation, I'm afraid, will be, given that it's 20 minutes, will be sparing on detail, but my paper, A Microhistory of the Event, has been published in a book on left aesthetics in, on, in South Asia titled Forms of the Left. Now, scholarship on left-wing aesthetics has largely emphasized elite artistic practices associated with privileges such as access to capital, social networks, and mobility. The focus has commonly been on the material cultural object, a book, a film, or painting, or the individual artist and their understanding of universal ideas and values. The presentation today looks at a subaltern cultural form. Um, the men, the village festival, which is now at least in the context of South Asia has been associated with the con construction of communal or national identities. I argue in this presentation, as I do in the larger paper, that Kagmari was a collective aesthetic production that embodied a prefigurative radical politics of subaltern internationalism. I argue that it was an immersive political theater a total work of art that disrupted the borders between politics and performance, artists and audience, sacred and profane, and the past and future. You will hear me talk about Maulana Bashani a lot in this paper. Now, this was why he was one of the primary organizers of the Kagmari Festival. And I wanted to introduce him before I sort of began the paper, the meat of the paper. Now, Bashani was known as the Red Mola, otherwise known as Red Molana, was a rebel politician, a peasant and worker leader, and a Sufi saint in East Bengal. He was this larger than life, crude and rustic figure who made politicians laugh and uncomfortable as well in parliament. He was a fiery public orator and a menace to various colonial and post-colonial regimes. In my larger work, I show how Bashani deploys a certain kind of noise now, I use noise here to refer to sounds out of place, sounds that were considered undisciplined, transgressive, disturbing and disorderly in political spaces. Now, these are sounds that are usually associated with subaltern communities, which created elite discomfort. For example, in Gagmari, Bashani skillfully draws on subaltern laughter and joy to make politicians feel uncomfortable, who are accustomed by that point to other kinds of subaltern sounds. And he deploys it as well, this idea of subal this, the subaltern joy as an important political sound of the future. So let me begin. <clears throat> In 1957, Maulana Bashani called for the council convention 
of his party, the Awami League, to be held in Thugmari, a small village north of Dhaka in February. Just a few months earlier, in September 1956, the party found itself in the unlikely position of having secured political power in Pakistan in both the center and in the province. This would be the only time that this would happen in the case of, in the history of a united Pakistan before the East Bengalis entered into a liberation war against the center in 1971. But Bashani did not intend this to be a celebratory convention but a showdown between him and another leading member of the party, Hussein Surawadi, who was now the Prime Minister of Pakistan. Surawadi's entry as, a prime, as the Prime Minister meant a U-turn in the party's position on foreign policy. He embraced nuclear armament, military pacts, and imperial support. Bashani, the founder president of the party, however, remained firm <coughs> in his position on third world solidarity and, and anti-imperialism. In fact, this has deepened with his relationship, um, with his trip to Europe and his relationship to international left organizations, such as the World Peace Council. Bashani felt that the people could not truly be sovereign if they were bound into asymmetrical relations and drawn into wars that were not of their making and with other sort of newly independent third world countries. So unlike previous council conventions held typically in the city with only party members and urban intellectuals in attendance, the 1957 council convention was to be held in a village. But this village would be transformed into a capital with roads, electricity and communal kitchens organized through a labor of peasants and working class volunteers. Kagmari would go on for six days instead of the usual two to three days with international guests in attendance, singers, dancers, art exhibitions, ferris wheels, which you see here, and, and candies. So Bashani wanted an event that strengthened um, his demand for love and friendship between the newly decolonized Afro-Asian bloc and undermined Sohrawadi's support for the military pacts. So in early February, he puts out this ad, which you see in front of you, the Deshed Dag, the call of the nation. Now, the advert signaled a desire for a different audience than the usual constituency of students and intellectuals from metropolitan Dhaka. In another advert, the ad, it was stated that the event was for the 95%, those who were poor cultivators, laborers, blacksmiths, potters, etc., and with all those whose money the country runs. They were the ones that should attend Kagmari. Now, these kinds of um, population distributions have usually been thought about in terms of communal majorities, minorities, at least in the context of um, South Asia. But at Kagmari, they took on a class complexion. The Awami League Party Council Convention, usually a closed door session, was now thrown, thrown open to all of the people that Suharwadi and the other senior Awami League workers had excluded from their discussions on the Cold War, foreign policy, and more broadly, the formal sphere of politics. So what did this council, so these are some of the sort of um, sort of event notes, sort of uh, the organizing notes of the conference itself. So what did this council convention look like? So this is, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, it's taking place in a small village, but it transformed during this period of the festival. So those who organized or attended the event describe how this backward village, the Ojparagal, transformed into an Ostai Rajdhani, a temporary capital. The sights and sounds one associated with the village in East Bengal in the 1950s was nowhere to be found in Kagmari. So you have an unmetalled road network that's constructed to help attendees travel to the festival. Constant electricity, um, supply of clean water, outdoor latrines which produce no strange smells, huge furnaces to cook food fit for foreign for, for all the guests, foreign and otherwise, and medical arrangements on standby. So what did this changing infrastructure, aesthetics, and Dugmary present? I argue that it presented a vision of the power 
and possibilities contained within rural spaces and constituencies, a role otherwise denied to them and transferred to urban spaces and their citizens. But it was more than a, an attempt at bringing the capital to the village. It was a rebuke to those who thought politics could only happen in modern spaces by showing that peasants other than and other rural inhabitants were as modern, progressive and capable of, of political thought as their urban and elite counterpart, counterparts, Togmari displaced elite knowledge and power. Moreover, by creating the capital in a village, he simultaneously disrupted how the village and city were sense perceived, were to be sense perceived and understood by encouraging people to come together, eat, sleep, occupy spaces, discuss politics, and have fun whilst doing it. For six days, the Kagmari Festival showed how the city too could be lived differently outside of Capsule's ordering of time and space. So let me talk more about this, the festival and what it sort of represented. The American vice consul was one of the sort of guests at Kagmari. Now, he was a keen observer for various reasons, and he described a lively atmosphere at Kagmari. He wrote of the crowds milling around the scores of shops and stalls, and the many hundred of, hundreds of workers who had come to cheer and watch the fun besides the actual councillors. Atikur Rahman Yusufzai, who was an eight-year-old at that time, recalled travelling with his father by rickshaw and foot to attend the huge village fair. He was left awestruck by the sights of various shops, food stores, colorful gates, and the prominent leaders sitting on the day. Joinal Fakir, a disciple of Bashani's, attended the, um, the festival, and he described it as a birat shobdo, a loud noise, and a hoihalla, which is even louder noise, basically, with stalls, music, and people coming from all directions, carrying sticks and spears. The few visual traces that exist of the events corroborate the carnivorous nature of gathering, capturing the carousals, the ferris wheels, and the crowd in motion. Now, Cogbury was a unique, um, syncretic combination of a wide range of largely South Asian cultural forms, the Mela, the village festival, the Urs, which is the festival that takes place on the death of the saint, um, on the anniversary of the death of the saint, it was also a celebration of earlier, sort of more pre-colonial sort of forms um, of the Mughal sort of traveling camps and Congress um, and sort of Mughal traveling camps. The, the festival also had an international dimension to it too. So the late 19th and 20th century saw a flourishing of world fairs or international expositions in Europe and North America, showcasing scientific, industrial, and cultural achievements of different cultures, advocating putatively universal ideas of progress, science, and modernity. Now, what these world fairs were, were actually material manifestations of imperial desires and cultures of abandon, abundance. In the post-colonial era, the, um, the Afro-Asian Conference and the Soviet organized events like the World Peace Council and World Festival of Youth offered counter projects of decolonized anti-imperial futures. So Kogmari was a hybrid of these forms. It offered an alternative model of abundance of progressive, flexible socialist futures based on South Asian vernacular culture, aware of international models, but confident of, of advancing in its own path. So one of the main objectives of Kagmari that I argue was that it was meant to be a pedagogical space. It was meant to offer people a sense of what futures built on some alternate international would, internationalism would look like by enacting some of those political connections, relations, emotions at Kagmari. Here, when I'm referring to some alternate internationalism, I'm talking about the productive con connections and relations between the globally disenfranchised. Now, the idea at Gangri was that if people were to see that it was possible to inhabit the world differently, then they would want to change it. But this world that they, um, um, but this world was to be experienced in an, not in an abstract way, but through local, concrete, and visible forms, through things that could be touched, seen, smelled, and heard. Now, and those sensations were central for producing thought and energy. 
The intent of Kogmari was not just to draw crowds, but to produce an atmosphere of fun and happiness. Festival laughter was seen as a generative and powerful energy for confronting the present and building new futures. Now, the significance of subtle awesome humor is shown by Shankar Ramaswamy in his excellent work on Mazak, fun, amongst metal factory workers in Delhi. So Shankar Ramaswamy, when talking about the sort of the humor that went on between metal factory workers, talks about Mazak, fun, affirms life. It asserts the urge and passion to create, connect, and unify, and the desire to live contra the drives of mere self-preservation, end quote. So in contrast to the traditional confrontations with power where peasants and workers are either seen to be pleading or protesting, Bashani used the sounds of positive laughter emanating from the festival to project new images of the community. But this politics of joy was not meant as a performance for Suharwadi and the elite, but to orientate the communities, the subaltern communities towards left futures. The physical feeling of collective joy togetherness generated by the laughter, chattering and hustle bustle at Kogmari was to offer a physical embodied sense of diverse popular gatherings and the power that a demotic left future could bring to the people. In other words, joy, laughter and happiness was integral to the experience and intellection of solidarity and internationalism. So there's three things that Bashani does, three festival techniques in um, as to educate his constituency. He uses these festival gates, um, folk culture and lectures. And I'll talk briefly about two of them. I'm going to talk about the gates and I'm going to talk about the, the music and the dances that took place at the festival. Now, the gates, numbering somewhere between 50 to 100, were one of the most striking sites of Kagmari Shomelon, dotting the four to five mile route from town to the village. Itself. So they have the names of political, religious, and cultural figures, mainly men emblazoned on them, sort of ranging from Mao, Stalin, Ataturk, Shakespeare, Prophet, the Prophet, more regional leaders such as Gandhi, Chitranjan Dash, Haji Suryatullah, Rabindranath Tagore. Although it was Jinnah and not the Prophet, his name was printed on the most lavish and the highest number of gates. There was no serious attempt to arrange these gates or to endow any ornamental hierarchical privilege on any identifiable category. The names had different levels of familiarity and associations for the audience. But it's possible that the groups who derive some, if not the greatest pedagogical benefits from the gates were the workers and peasants for whom many of these names as they rolled off their tongues must have seemed foreign and un unfamiliar. It is not possible to retrieve the stories that were told or imagined by the peasants or workers as they walked through the gates and noticed the prophet's name before and after rows of unfamiliar names, perhaps we can allow for some speculation. It is possible that the row of arches, a structural feature in Mughal imperial architecture, paradoxically played a similar as well as a radically different function in Kagmari. Historically, they've denoted the king's rule and power and the connection between different spaces. Now, the arches at Kogmo demonstrated a similar veneration for authority, but it was not vested in a single individual idea, past or geography, but rather to multiple and variegated geographies, peoples, religions, and cultures. Where the military pacts offered belonging to an exclusive club of nation states, the gates were infused with a spirit I argue, of radical equality. The peasants and laborers were shown that they were part of the wider, richer, moral and cultural universe where lessons and examples from Mao, Lenin or Abraham Lincoln could be drawn upon, although perhaps not given the same way. The, so the haphazard ordering of the gates were perhaps not as arbitrary as initially assumed, but designed to place emphasis on the connections between those life roles, revolutionary cultures, rather than what divided them. Let me now move on to the songs. Um, ooh, okay, yes, great. Um, so the performing arts were also used for similar pedagogical effect at the Kagmari Festival. Around the beginning of the festival period, in the dead hours of the night, the camp dwellers and villagers of Kagmari were startled out of their sleep. 
Bashani, Sahrawi, another guest, curious to see what was going on, came out of their dwelling. The sounds coming from a mile off were the deep and powerful, powerful voice of a folk sing singer from the Chores, the Sandbank Island of Hobbygonj, which is in Salem. Now, um, the folk singer Parimal Disk, Daskopla, accompanied by his troupe, were, sang the, Mongolka, the Mount Batten Mongol Kabir as they approached the festival space. So, Sorry, I'm going to stop it just because I'm sure that we're running out of time. Now, this was the prelude to the ambitious and varied program of music, dance, martial arts, films and lectures that took place on the various um, platforms erected on the Kagmari's Maidan. The crowds came lured by the energetic and frenzied martial arts performances of Latikela and various forms of sword play. Sorry, this sort of slide is not completely relevant to what I'm saying. And so they came, you know, um, sort of lured by the, the martial arts performances, the sword plays. But the highlights of the program, though, were the various folk artists and troops had come from all areas of the province, even some parts of West Pakistan to perform. The popularity of these art forms were not just purely based on entertainment or the evocation of particular modes and emotions, but also on their pedagogical function found in the form and content. The songs at Kagmari featured strong anti-colonial and anti-capitalist themes that drew upon the dry, diverse world, life worlds of the performance. Ramesh Seel, a virtuoso performer in the Kobigan genre, now the Kobigan are musical duels. He was from the Napit cast in Chittagong, and his compositions reflected his association with the left movement from the colonial period and onwards. One of the songs that he sang in sort of Kang Murray was, I'll just read out one of the lyrics. How have our minds and bodies been freed living in Pakistan? How is a state running on foreign wealth free? Ramesh Shield's performance and that of others demanded and built on the generative noise and response of the audience. In turn, the audience also became performers, producing the political content. The immersive nature of these performances helped to form anti-imperial political subjectivities at Gangmari. Do I have five minutes more? Five minutes. Okay, five minutes is good. I'm going to. So, you can have three minutes more. <laughs> three minutes more. Okay. So it was not simply male performers that graced the stages at Kagmari. Madam Azuri from the West Wing also performed with her dance company. Now, Azuri of German Indian descent was the first great item dancer of Hindi cinema. In the, in the 1930s and 40s, she appeared in popular and low budget movies as a dancing girl performing. Um, seemingly oriental dancing forms. <clears throat> so what does her performance in, in this village in East Bengal at the site of a Sufi shrine and in front of a mixed audience comprised mostly of pe rural peasants and workers imply? On the one hand, Mazam Azuri's performance taps in into older traditions of professional dancers at Sufi shrines. But on the other, it speaks to this attitude of openness to difference that Bashani and other Kagmari organizers wanted to cultivate, where the public performance of a woman was a normalized event rather than something exceptional. After all, all Azuri was only doing what the other male performers had done, telling stories and ed educating people through her art and labor. So... I'll move on. So these were some of the things that we used, um, the gates and the songs to sort of teach on sort of internationalism and to draw on the sort of subalts and joy. So let me conclude and, and um, on what I think we should take away from Kagmari. So Kagmari Shammalan, I argue, reframes our understanding of the history, politics and aesthetics of the left in South Asia. It offers a radical narrative, which is the prefigurative politics of futures beyond nationalism. 
It is the story of internationalism versus nationalism. In most studies, internationalism is the hallmark of state or elite actors and their formal gathering in metropolitan spaces. The focus is on the auditoriums and the conference hall, the impressive addresses of you know, statesmen, statesman-like figures and the formal resolutions that are made. Dagmarie contests such readings, as well as the subalterns, it contests such readings, as well as the subaltern studies claim that the limits of the subaltern and progressive politics were shaped by their inability to engage or imagine in worlds beyond what they were familiar with. Instead, I've shown how peasants and workers connected their every li everyday lives to the international through the material, cultural, and sonic practices of the Mela. Kagmari was about the forging of a new political community that rejected strong and muscular nationalism in favor of affective solidarities and connections between the newly decolonized nation. The freedom and dignity of the 95% could be realized only through a class-based internationalism. As students of left aesthetics, Kagmari, Kagmari de deserves our attention for thinking about how more creative and alternative left politics, cultures, and future, futures were fashioned by different constituencies. Some of the most imp important progressive political movements of recent years have come from occupied space. Think about Shaheen Bagh in India, Tahrir Square, and the Ind Indignados movement. These and other creative protests have reworked and combined existing cultural forms for progressive ends. In the UK and beyond, we had Reclaim the Streets, which reinterpreted the Free Party as a site of environmental and workers' resistance. We have the Climate Camp, which envisioned the festival as collective labour and co-education, and Occupy, which reimagined the assembly as radically democratic and rebellious. So the tradition of cultural politics has a longer history. And at Kagmari, we see a unique South Asian example. Um, there are criticisms of the ability of these movements to physically sustain themselves outside the limited spaces of their occurrence, leading to disunity and fragmentation. Yet the event themselves do continue to have political effects. Perhaps we can say that the enduring legacy has been to change the way people see the world long after the movement is finished. In short, left futures once seen cannot be unseen. The task of the scholar then scholars um, here and elsewhere is perhaps to help trace and gather the scatter of these visions and ask how we can use them to vitalize and interrupt the present to build futures anew. Thank you. Thank you.